vehicles, even though design work, if anything, increased the pace at this time. Throughout the 1950s, US tank designers were looking at every aspect of the problems of tank technology, from armor to propulsion and armament. Whereas a lot of development had made great strides during this time in other areas, armor was still fundamentally based upon large steel castings. Various ideas though had been tried, including compositions with glass and armor cavities, and even work on bar armor to defeat incoming projectiles and the increasingly common heat-type warheads. By the early 1960s though, even with a new generation of main battle tanks at hand, the US was short of a light modern tank, which was air-transportable, amphibious, well-armed and well-protected. Obviously, this is a holy grail of tank design, light enough weight to be air transportable but with enough armor protection to be useful in direct battle rather than just scouting or skirmish rolls. The tank which was to become the M551 Sheridan was in development. This was not the only possible light tank in development at the time. Another design from the Forsyth brothers was also being planned and this vehicle was a technological step ahead of anything the Sheridan offered. The first glimpse of this vehicle came in a competition held by the US Armor Association in 1962, with an entry deadline of August that year. Welcome to a new Tank Encyclopedia voiced article, covering a very little known American Cold War light tank. Before we continue, we would like to especially thank all of our patrons who make our work possible, and especially Gustavo Sanchez this time for his generous donations. The first thing to address in looking at this design are the designers, John and Robert Forsyth. John and Robert were brothers who were engineers living in California and worked at the Vehicle Systems Development Division of the Lockheed Aircraft Corporation in California. Over the years, they designed and developed various transportation-related vehicles, amongst other things. These included a large bus for cars to travel in, and various forms of unusual traction machines, including a tri-wheeled amphibious vehicle and articulated machines. Whether the tank design was already being considered prior to the armor competition of 1962 is not clear, but it was certainly submitted meaning it must have been ready before the end of August 1962. Despite a multitude of light tank designs considered during various conferences during the 1950s, it was not until January 1959 that work had begun in earnest on a new light combat vehicle under the designation Armored Reconnaissance Airborne Assault Vehicle, or ARAAV. The specifications demanded of that design were presented in July 1959 by Ordnance Tank Automotive Command. That vehicle was going to have to replace the existing stock of M41 light tanks, the M56 self-propelled gun, and supplement or work alongside the existing main battle tanks and armored personnel carriers in service. Development was still woefully underprotected even outside the weight limit imposed. As a result, the allowance for weight was increased to 13.6 tons and was designated AR-AAV XM551, the progenitor of the M551 Sheridan. What that design sacrificed in weight and size, it made up for in armament, with a 152mm main gun capable of firing a large heat round as well as the Shailela missile with a heat warhead. Both of those weapons were capable of taking out even the heaviest contemporary Soviet armor, and also provide fire support for airborne troops. Other weapons under consideration at the time were a conventional 76mm, 90mm, 105mm, and even 152mm guns, NTAC to supplement any conventional gun, TOWs or Polcat missiles. The first pilot XM551s were delivered in June 1962 for testing, 
with more pilots following in 1963, 1964 and 1965. Despite teething problems, the design was authorized for production and contracts issued in April 1965. The M551 went on to provide decades of service for the US military in various conflicts, but it never really lived up to expectations. The armor was always inadequate, and the firepower from the gun missile system never really worked well. A contemporary design, though, offered some solutions to what became the flaws in the M551 Sheridan, whilst at the same time adding another layer of complexity to meet the demand to replace the old and obsolescent M41 and M56 vehicles in service. Providing a main battle tank class vehicle at a significantly reduced weight, this design was supposed to add mobility as it could go places a conventional tank, light or otherwise, could not go. Having won the tank design competition with their design at the end of 1962, the Forsyth brothers and the Lockheed Aircraft Corporation were anxious to secure and market the idea. The result was an embodiment in the pay Eaton application filled in January 1963, but there was nothing in that application other than the layout. What is showed was a small tank with five road wheels on each side, topped with a low-profile rounded turret. Inside that turret can be seen one large caliber gun and a smaller secondary armament. Most striking in that design though is what is behind the tank, a trailer. Not just a trailer in fact, but another tracked hull with five road wheels but where the armored body is taller, reaching nearly the height of the turret of the preceding vehicle. The two sections were connected together through an articulated joint. The details of the articulated design would be made clear in a following application filed in July that year. The articulation was carried out by means of an assembly consisting of two rings, the outer of which has two arms connected to the hull of one vehicle, which controlled the pitch and roll between the two vehicles. The inner ring was mounted by means of an internally rotating shoe to a yoke which was fixed rigidly to the other vehicle. In this way, the coupling allowed for a controlled degree of rotation between the two sections, as well as movement sideways, as encountered when steering, and vertically, as encountered when climbing or descending. The armor in the 1962 armor competition submission was described as a steel and aluminum alloy with a maximum thickness of 76 to 150 millimeters. This was clearly subject for more thought, and the focus of the design submitted for patent in July 1963 was exactly the armor. Instead of relying on a homogeneous steel plate which was face hardened and heavy and vulnerable to shape charges, the Forsyth brothers envisioned a new system. This system consisted of a series of layers, a first and second layer of rigid armor spaced apart from each other with the cavity between them filled with a multitude of different armor panels, which were themselves held apart by a filler material proposed to be cellular or a foam type material. This armor system extended across the entirety of the front of the tank, covering the glacis and lower hull but also along the full length of the upper hull side sponsons over the tracks. The lower hull, in order to save bulk, was just the single thickness stiff section. Likewise, the roof was a single thickness of metal, as was the rear. The panels inside the armor cavities were suggested as being made from a variety of possible materials, including glass fiber or metal fabric laminated together, coated with flexible epoxyurethane resin. Other epoxy resins, polyurethane and plastics, could also be substituted. The filler material between those panels served to hold them apart and offer rigidity, and was to consist of polyurethane resin too. The difference between this resin filler and the other resin used was that this filler resin was also to contain cyclohexyl stearate or dimmer acid and a lead, cadmium or boron compound as protection against neutron radiation, 
In other areas where this filter did not need to be used throughout the cavity, it was to be substituted with foam, as this was a good thermal insulator and provided buoyancy. As an aside, Forsyth also considered that this armor was suitable for consideration on ships and submarines. The projected weight for both parts was just 19 to 20 tons for the steel aluminum armor version and 21 to 29 tons for the composite armored version, depending on the exact composition. The composite armor option was a significant improvement over the original steel and aluminum option and provided the design with substantially more protection than that of the Sheridan against both kinetic energy and shape charge munitions. As shown in the patents, there were two weapons mounted on the tank, and later a third weapon mounted on the following unit. The tank's weapons consisted of a single large caliber gun of an undisclosed size in the patent, although it bears a close resemblance to a gun like that on the M551, the 152mm. Bearing in mind that requirements from the army, as stated before, included 76mm, 90mm, 105mm and even 152mm guns, intact tow or polecat missiles, one of those would have been chosen, and what is shown is too large for either the 76 or 90mm guns. In their competition entry, the Forsyth brothers were clear that they planned a 155mm gun as the primary weapon capable of firing rocket-assisted projectiles. The secondary armament, as it appears in the patents, appears to be a cannon, but is only described as the secondary armament for anti-personnel purposes. No mention is made of the third gun at the back, which could be assumed to be a machine gun. In the competition entry, the secondary gun is confirmed as a 20mm Hispano Suiza HSS-820 automatic cannon in the front vehicle and the small turret at the back is confirmed to take a 7.62mm Vulcan type machine gun. The M551 was to have a crew of 4, as the use of a free man turret was seen as having value in combat. The design from Loki though went away from that idea and back to a free man crew with just 2 in the turret. The two men, one being the commander and gunner? and the other being the gunner and loader, it is not clear, was seated on the left and right respectively. The driver, lying supine, to reduce the overall height of the vehicle, was located on the front left of the hull, with the engine to his right. Although being self-powered and able to operate independently of the following unit, the unit behind contained more men. Four more men in the back acted as a small, armored personnel carrier team attached to the main tank and accessed it via a door at the back. They could egress the vehicle to fight or carry out tasks dismounted, and in the final patent publications drawings, this following unit had gained a small turret with a gun, so as to provide additional firepower. As part of a platoon of such tanks, the men in the rear sections would end up being a unit 15 to 40 strong, without the need for additional APCs to follow. The engine for the first section of the vehicle was located in the front right of the hull, and centrally in the second section. It is only described as a piston unit or a gas turbine, which drove an alternative current electrical generator. That electrical power was then delivered to the back of the tank, in the case of the lead unit, where traction units drove the sprockets. On the trailing unit, the same system was used, except that the electrical traction units and sprockets were at the front. Steering was electrohydraulic, able to adjust power to the tracks on each side of each section to vary the turning moment applied, but also allowed for steering forces to be applied through the coupling hydraulically. Suspension for both sections was by means of a flat band track mounted on a long pitch, large diameter road wheels. Although the designers did suggest that if the tracks were not suitable, a multi-axle wheel system could be substituted instead. One advantage of this arrangement of power, with two independently powered sections connected by articulated joints, was flexibility. 
either vehicle could operate completely independently or together. If one unit failed or broke, the other could push or pull it along, reducing the chances of the vehicle becoming stuck or crippled. Further though, the independence of the electrical transmission provided additional benefits. The sections could be split and have power sent from one half to the other via cable even though they are not attached. This means that the vehicle did not have to float across waterways, but instead could submerge and receive power from another tank on the bank. Once it got to the other side, it started up and sent power to the following tank in a system very similar to that adopted for the German mouse in World War II. It made loading onto aircraft for transport easier too. The design from the Forsyth brothers and Lockheed was, in many ways, ahead of its time. The coupling concept was not new, ideas for coupled tanks date back to 1915. And although the coupling in 1962-1963 was undoubtedly better designed than the ones from 1915, it was still not a perfected technology. Lighter than the M551, this design offered increased protection and capability and the potential for improved firepower, but it was unlikely to have ever received serious consideration. By the time the first patent was filled, the US Army's eyes were on the XM551 project, which offered a lot of what they wanted without having to use new and as of yet unproven technologies. The potential offered by this design was thus lost. It received no orders and was never built. Coupled vehicles would continue to be examined by a variety of countries for a variety of purposes, as would coupled tanks and electric drive and composite hulls. This design, however, seems to be the first design to combine all of these elements in one. This was all for this video. Make sure to follow and subscribe and also check out our website we'll be releasing new articles on the regular. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or Reddit. If you use Discord, there's a link to our community server in the description. And if you would like to help us continue to develop and expand, consider donating on Patreon or PayPal. All of the funds will be used to help us improve and design new articles and features for you. Until next time, keep us in your sights.